Thank you so much. And it's my fault that the date is 1916. I changed my mind about that after I submitted the abstract to make it clearer for you all because this is when Dixon started, when he joined Foster and Kleiser, the billboard advertising company. Well, it's a real treat to talk to you today about Dixon's billboards, and I am honored to be here. Um, this comes from a dissertation chapter, so there's a lot more I could say about billboards, and if any of you want to talk about them later, I hope you'll email me or find me. Okay. In 1921, the California painter, color theorist, and advertising sales manager, Charles W. Duncan, announced, quote, the time has come when outdoor advertising has possessed itself of real beauty through the highest grade of talent available. Outdoor advertising on the Pacific coast has blazed the way for the rest of the country, end quote. While prone to flowery language, Duncan was not really exaggerating. His San Francisco-based employer, Foster and Kleiser, congratulated itself in print for its attractive billboards, its truth-telling commentary, and especially for its employment of the best artistic talent. That talent, by 1921, numbered more than 20 billboard designers, including Duncan's brother-in-law, the celebrated Western artist Maynard Dixon. Already a nationally acclaimed illustrator, Dixon supplemented his income between 1916 and 1921 with billboard designs and commercial illustrations for Foster and Kleiser. In 1945, one year before his death, Dixon reflected on his career and attributed the turning point in his work from an illustrative to more poetic and decorative approach to his years in billboard advertising. But this crucial brief period in the career of one of the most well-known artists of the American West has been largely overlooked. In billboard design, I argue, Dixon developed compositional strategies that would shape his mature paintings for decades and through which he would express his attitude about the West. But for his employer, Foster and Kleiser, Dixon's billboards served as a method of promoting billboards themselves alongside haberdashers, cola, and tires. Okay. So the elephant in the room is that Dixon's billboards no longer exist, right? Um, so what you're going to see today are black and white photographs of his designs that were used to reproduce them in period advertising journals. And then the color images that you see will largely be um, original gouache studies, okay? Quote, no medium of advertising has the right to take up the attention of the public unless it pays for that attention in terms of service or beauty. So proclaimed Charles Duncan in 1921. Uh, can you imagine any advertiser making this claim today? <laughs> um, by producing beautiful advertising, Foster and Kleiser sought to sell the public on billboards merits at a time when proposed legislation continually threatened to ban the signs. To combat perceptions of billboards as immoral eyesores, Duncan hired Dixon, Harold von Schmidt, Louis Seacrest, and Roy Partridge, among others. Dixon's second wife, the photographer Dorothea Lang, remembered Foster and Kleiser's art department as, quote, a stable of people who behaved abominably. They were paid a lot of money, they showed up when they pleased, they did as they pleased, and they made wonderful billboards. These billboards were really quite fine, end quote. Typically, Dixon's and his colleagues' fine billboards featured pastoral subjects or cheerful images of the upper class pursuing outdoor activities like fox hunting and tennis. Throughout these images, Dixon sells the product through images of Californians enjoying the outdoors. An outdoor setting was in fact key to Duncan's recipe for beautiful billboards. And according to San Francisco's advertising boosters, Western scenery distinguished West Coast advertising from the rest of the country. Editors of the San Francisco-based journal Western Advertising advised, quote, our mountains are lofty, covered with eternal snows. Get them into the picture, end quote. Dixon's pastoral view of sporting life on a billboard promoting the Oakland, Antioch, and Eastern Railway seems to directly respond to this challenge, get the mountains into the picture. Dixon and Duncan both considered color critical to beautiful advertising. Duncan compared it at the height of prohibition in 1921 to the, quote, kick in drinks, end quote. 
Thus, Dixon's and his colleagues' billboards typically feature complementary colors and va value contrasts. Crimson lettering and flashes of red dazzle against pale green, light turquoise, and deep blue backgrounds. They avoid hues that Duncan termed depressing and associated with offices and hospitals, that is, dreary gray, pale washed out blue, and sickly white. You know, in other words, he would have hated the interior design trends of the past decade. And there's another example for you. To further associate their images with fine art, Foster and Kleiser framed and illuminated their billboards. Their mammoth deluxe bulletins, shown here, were flanked with decorative columns resembling, resembling voluptuous women and surrounded by manicured lawns and flowering gardens. Now, Foster and Kleiser's largest, most expensive signs were also hand-painted three times a year, reinforcing the notion that these images were indeed unique art artworks and a positive addition to the land or cityscape. And then they advertised their advertising. <laughs> okay. Concurrent with the push for beauty through color and scenery in West Coast billboard design was a national demand for truth in advertising. This movement targeted advertising's copy, um, advertising copy's exaggeration of the positive effects of consumer goods and culminated in state laws requiring honest verbiage. By 1916, Maynard Dixon had also committed himself to truth and beauty. When Dixon spoke of truth and honest work, he meant truth to his personal aesthetic vision. Where design was concerned, simplicity and limited text characterized Dixon's vision, evident in his early posters for Oberlin Monthly. Dixon's modern approach led him to spar with his mentor, Los Angeles journalist Charles Lummis in 1901, over cover designs for Out West magazine. Lummis preferred an outmoded and cluttered Victorian aesthetic, evident in covers for Out West's predecessor, Land of Sunshine. Okay. Dixon protested, quote, you can't rush good design and you can't crowd in dignity at the top of the page, end quote. While Dixon defined good design as uncrowded or uncluttered, he predicated honest design on the freedom to develop and refine his own ideas rather than his clients. He admitted, quote, I must base my work on my own ideas. I could not claim credit for a worked over adaptation of anybody else's idea, end quote. Later, when Dixon was working in New York following the San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906, he again struggled with producing other people's ideas, but this time concerning the West itself. Although winning large illustration commissions, he tired of the overly melodramatic and violence-laced depiction of Western life he was often tasked to create as illustrations for popular fiction. And he felt disgust for the Wild West show-influenced portrayal of Westerners deemed authentic by Easterners, claiming such performances made it, quote, hard to sell anything that is not faked to the limit, end quote. Fed up after five years as an illustrator in New York, he wrote to Lummis in January 1912, and you all will be familiar with this quotation, quote, I am being paid to lie about the West. I'm done with all that. I'm going back home where I can do honest work in my own way, end quote. Dixon and his family packed their bags and returned to California, where shortly later, on the verge of World War I, he became Foster and Kleiser's top billboard designer. Around 1919, Dixon began designing billboards and newspaper advertisements for Foster and Kleiser's new client, the Savage Tire Company of San Diego. The firm, named for its founder, Arthur W. Savage, manufactured puncture-proof steel, steel tires that could withstand rough western roads. Prior to Foster and Kleiser's acquisition of the account, Savage's print ads, and I apologize for this image, typically traded on racial stereotypes, featuring crude cuts of a generic Indian figure wearing a feather bonnet, wielding arrows, and accompanied by the cringeworthy to us slogan, savages invade. And these were produced by a New York-based advertising firm which had an office in LA. Such advertisements were not unlike the melodramatic tales Dixon had been tasked to illustrate during his New York years. Both relied on mainstream notions of Western life as fraught with danger and on a reductive portrayal of Native Americans as violent and inhuman. 
While he had no control over his client's name, Dixon challenged the meaning of the term savage as presented in the earlier campaign. He did this by romanticizing indigenous, specifically Blackfeet, life as a colorful pageant of outdoor freedom. In essence, he exchanged one set of lies about the West for another, trading the portrayal of Native Americans in popular illustration for a color-rich, nostalgic, and paternalistic image in line with Duncan's ideals of beautiful advertising. Now, rather than apply the term savage to people, Dixon's billboards characterized the tire itself as a wild creature and made the protagonist of this campaign a young Blackfeet boy. Okay, and his gouache studies can be read as a narrative, and if you indulge me, I think they went something like this. So at top, having journeyed south from Montana to the Arizona desert, the child, who was referred to as, I'm um, not joking, Little Heap, strains against the taut end of a lariat. His prey, a tire rendered in heroic scale at far right, expand, excuse, excuse me, escapes the bounds of picture space, looming above low distant mesas and its youthful captor. A zoomorphic tire threatens the child in the lower study, where he aims an arrow at, presumably, a competitor's inferior tube. It rears rattlesnake-like, bearing its stem valve, ready to strike. Dixon clearly intended the viewer to empathize with the child, and his efforts worked. Little Heap was incredibly popular. Savage Tire's advertising director, Royal Lee, crowed gleefully, quote, this graceful little trade figure has touched the hearts of many people and awakened the interest that always exists for a little child, end quote. Um, returned home at top, Little Heap introduces the now domesticated tire to a group of seated Blackfeet elders. And below, stories are told about the mighty tire at camp. Um, the bottom maquette dramatically demonstrates Duncan's color preferences. Red lettering glows against deep blue, reprising the central figure's red blanket and the crimson firelight that illuminates the edges of the foreground figures. In 1913, Dixon acknowledged, quote, the melodramatic Wild West idea is not for me the big possibility, but rather the quiet of Western life, end quote. In the colors and the serene tone of these camp scenes, we see Dixon's self-proclaimed endeavor to, quote, interpret the poetry and pathos of Western life, seen amid the grandeur, sternness, and loneliness of the country, end quote. Dixon's narrative scenes were intended for Foster and Kleiser's elaborately framed deluxe bulletins installed in urban areas. Intended to resemble murals or picture windows, the billboards invited viewers to escape city sprawl into wide western landscapes. And here you can see one of Dixon's designs in Los Angeles surrounded by less picturesque signs, and so only if you um, paid for the most expensive locations did you get the manicured garden and the elaborate frame. Um, otherwise, this is what you ended up with. An implication of boundless space extending beyond the billboard characterized Western advertising, according to California, according to California designer Louis Treviso. He wrote in early 1921 that Western advertising art conveyed the West's, quote, vastness, its great distances, its high mountains, its enormous trees. The enormity of things, Treviso wrote, Paul mere man and bids him do great things, end quote. Dixon, too, was concerned with vastness. In 1936, he remarked, quote, I want to see man hooked up to something bigger than he is. Even my cowboy and Indian paintings are always a part of a big scene beyond the obvious landscape, end quote. Dixon's interest in the big scene is evident in his expansive warriors, painted the same year he joined Foster and Kleiser. The stretch of canvas unmistakably prefigures this assembly of Plains riders stretched out across another low golden ridge four years later. Now, in contrast to Dixon's urban billboards that inserted western landscapes into the city, savage billboards installed along rural highways where speeds were faster emphasized the tire over the Blackfeet narrative. Such placement was likely intended for this vibrant design. In it, Dixon makes overt parallels between the tire's rugged tread and the all-terrain soles and geometric patterns on brightly beaded moccasins. 
Here, the tire emblemizes not Blackfeet people so much as their lifestyle, a lifestyle essentialized as being freely on the move. But Blackfeet people no longer enjoyed such freedom of movement. The reservation system, allotment, and successive reductions of their land base had established political and economic boundaries that by 1920 constrained their movements in myriad ways. And of course, such boundaries are not evident in Dixon's billboards. Instead, he represented the Blackfeet community embracing tires, or put another way, embracing an object of modernity symbolic of the community's own mobility. For affluent consumers able to afford Savage's higher priced tires, the images were intended to drum up wonderlust and convince consumers that by outfitting their car with Savage tires, they too might roam Western landscapes. Dixon's gouache studies picture Blackfeet life much like the California lifestyle on his earlier billboards, that is, idyllic, romantic, and out of doors. In sum, they appeal to viewers' desire for an, Im for an imagined outdoor lifestyle rather than for the product itself. Now, Salvage's print ads also encouraged wanderlust. So there were a whole series of these that appeared in newspapers across the American West for multiple years, for, I mean, even after Dixon left Foster and Kleiser. They were illustrated by Dixon and also Harold von Schmidt, and they depict Little Heap basically touring um, famous Western locales as an ambassador for steel ball tires. Dixon's romantic portrayal of Blackfeet life in advertising also reflects the artist's nostalgia for his escape from heartbreak and a contentious divorce to Montana with his young daughter Constance in August 1917. Foster and Kleister and the Great Northern Railway arranged the trip, tasking Dixon to create advertising posters and paintings for Glacier National Park lodges. And also um, a Great Northern billboard campaign that was supposed to be erected on in California, which never came to fruition, probably because of World War I. So I would argue that these designs are um, the direct result of his experience in Montana and kind of what we might have expected to see on that Great Northern campaign. It was a remarkable gig considering the fact he had just joined the firm the year before. Artist and daughter Artist and daughter camped just outside Glacier with six Blackfeet families who sang, told stories, and modeled. They welcomed the Dixons to dances and the sweat lodge. Dixon wrote of his new acquaintances, quote, the Blackfeet are the best Indians I've seen yet, bar none, end quote. Constance would later recall sobbing when they left in October, quote, I wanted to stay and become an Indian, end quote. Dixon's billboards, in a sense, express a similar attitude, a longing by outsiders to escape reality and vicariously become an Indian. In billboard advertising, then, Dixon found a medium where he could portray the West in a way that more closely resembled his own feelings on the subject than the text of popular novels afforded him only a few, few years earlier. For Savage Tire's leadership, images like this constituted faithful, <laughs> faithful portrayals of Indians and Indian life. But ultimately, Dixon and his employers merely added another layer to the stereotypic pan-Indian depictions propagated by Wild West shows and advertising. Billboard design did, however, offer Dixon an opportunity to explore aesthetic honesty through developing compositional structures that reached fruition in the dynamic symmetry of his mature paintings of the 1930s. Typically, Dixon built balanced, asymmetrical billboard compositions on a four-column grid with large foreground color masses, that was his term, whether tire or cowboy, occupying one or two column widths on the front edge of picture space. In his spur cigarettes design, for example, the cowboy occupies the third of four vertical columns. The figure interrupts the wall behind him, that shallow diagonal, and divides the composition into dynamic negative spaces. Low horizons, shallow diagonals, and large foreground objects that activate negative space appear throughout Dixon's Forgotten Man series of the 1930s. His 1934 painting, Forgotten Man, clearly mimics, that is, mirrors his composition for Blackfoot Tread. Um, so, Forgotten Man's high vantage point, the low diagonal of the curb, the large foreground form, and the rhythmic pattern of feet at the top of picture space echo both the billboard's structure and content. 
The negative space reserved for text in the billboard becomes an empty expanse of curb, sidewalk, and street in the later painting that emphasizes the man's isolation from the crowd bustling past. In free speech and roadside, Dixon deploys silhouetted figures rendered in heroic scale. The rhythmic patterns, low diagonals, dramatic value contrasts, and active negative space further echo his billboard layouts. Likewise, in Home of the Blackfeet, painted in 1936, two decades after Dixon began working for Foster and Kleiser and after his Montana trip, we see a billboard transformed into a painting. One of Dixon's Savage Tire billboards, no longer extant, but re reproduced in miniature on the pages of Western advertising in 1922, resembles an early cropped version of Home of the Blackfeet. Pan up and out from the billboard's narrow swath of Montana plains, and the view transforms into the sweep of grassland, distant mountains, and Blackfeet homes of the later painting. So between 1916 and 1922, <coughs> Dixon began regarding himself, in the words of his biographer, Donald Haggerty, as an artist rather than an illustrator. It is no coincidence that these years paralleled his tenure at Foster and Kleiser. And yet Dixon later dismissed the period as years when he did, quote, very little painting, end quote. The ephemeral nature of his billboards soon rendered them all but invisible, reinforcing Dixon's claim that during this period, he produced no real work. Today, all that remains of Dixon's billboards are rare gouache studies, copy prints hidden in archives, and minute images printed in grayscale on the pages of period trade journals. Yet, the compositional strategies Dixon employed as a billboard designer are visible again and again in the paintings on view in this museum. What also remains 100 years after Dixon decamped Foster and Kleiser are billboards. On the heels of World War I, Dixon and his colleagues developed a West Coast advertising style characterized by harmonious color combinations, limited text, and idyllic views of outdoor life. Ultimately, their designs sold Foster and Kleiser's claim that advertising beautified the environment so successfully that our roads remain studded with billboards today. Um, thank you.